in the world there are many different scarcities i'm coming from india and in nepal in the city of india there was a devastating earthquake and there's great shortage of food and other resources apart from that there may be some areas where there is shortage of water there is shortage of medicine there are various kinds of shortages in this world however the greatest shortage is the shortage of a satisfying object of thought people don't have anything satisfying to think about and because of not having a satisfying object of thought people are in constant anxiety in fact tomorrow i'm going to give a talk uh, talk is the anxiety epidemic see the we have abundant material necessities yes there are definitely people who don't have any of the material necessities but even the people who have material necessities quite often they don't have a satisfying object of thought and whatever we think about often that ends up increasing our anxiety increasing our agitation and that's why the fundamental need for getting satisfaction in life is to have a satisfying object of thought just as you know when we want to build a family the first one of the first things that we require is a home so whenever we go out we may have to go for a job or some work or school or whatever shopping you know we come back home and we feel comfortable we feel secure we feel safe when we return home in fact that's why is a phrase in english it says feel at home feel at home means feel comfortable so we create a home for our body but what about a home for our consciousness a home for our thoughts a object of thought where when we think about it we feel at home we feel peaceful we feel secure we feel satisfied so the bhagavatam states धौतात्मा पुरुष कृष्ण पादमूल न मुंचते मुक्त सर्व परिक्लेश पांथा स्वशरण यथा द सेम एग्जांपल इज गिव्स पांथा पंथ इज पाथ पांथा इज वन हु ट्रैवल्स ऑन अ पाथ सो इट्स अ ट्रैवलर अ वियरी ट्रैवलर आफ्टर अ लॉन्ग जर्नी स्वशरण यथा व्हेन सच अ ट्रैवलर कम्स बैक होम दैट ट्रैवलर फील सो पीसफुल सो जॉयफुल सो कंफर्टेबल सो सेफ so it is said that a purified soul dhautatma here also the same root word is used in this 5.78 gyana nirdhuta kalmasha so nirdhuta dhautatma same thing so one who has been purified dhautatma purusha krishna such a person krishna pada moolam namunchati such a person never gives up the lotus feet of krishna why mukta sarva pari klesha because by meditating on krishna one becomes free from all anxiety not just anxiety any kind of distress mukta sarva pariklesha that is the speciality of krishna of making krishna as the home of our heart as the home of our inner world i write articles sometimes i write po- poems also so one of the poems i wrote is from an article smiling faces crying hearts so I, you know in materialistic society people celebrate by cheers and they have drinks and they say cheers so quite often this is just a facade their hearts are filled with fears their hearts are filled with fears their minds are pierced by desires their minds are pierced by desires they are on the verge of tears and they say cheers <laughs> so from the external point of view it may all seem very comfortable and cozy but internally there are these two forces there are anxieties and there are desires which rip us apart and they don't allow us to be peaceful so we meditate on krishna not just as a provider of things that is one level of meditating on god that we go to god and god as prabhupada would say that 
<coughs> the Christians pray that. Prabhupada was respectful to Christians. At the same time, he would point out that the mainstream version of Christianity doesn't focus much on God. It focuses on man. So, Father, thou art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, give us our daily bread. Now, there are some Christian theologians who explain that bread has a very sophisticated meaning. But for the common people, it is just that, oh, Father, give us our daily bread. So, Prabhupada would say, yes, it is good that people are going to God for bread, but then such a prayer shows not their love for God, but their love for bread. <laughs> <laughs> so, if I can get bread from some other source, then there's no need to go to God. So, of course, any way we go to God, that is good. But we, we undersell ourselves when we go to God for anything material. Because that material thing cannot actually provide us shelter. Cannot provide us, as I said, a satisfying object of thought. And this is the commonplace mysticism of bhakti. Now, mysticism is generally thought of as something very extraordinary and special. But bhakti makes mysticism commonplace. How is that? That anybody who chants the name of Krishna, anybody who hears the pastimes of Krishna, anybody who meditates on Krishna can experience some kind of uplifting. Just thinking about Krishna, hearing about Krishna, one feels a sort of strength, a sort of solace, a sort of satisfaction. And that actually indicates to us that this is Krishna, this is God whose shelter I'm experiencing. It's like if there is a small baby, uh, the baby says uh, is sleeping in her room and it's very cold at night. Uh, the baby may not you know, is half asleep and if she's very newborn, she may not even understand the concept of my mother. She drinks milk from the mother, she feels very happy when her mother takes care of her. But she may not understand and she's sleeping and is trembling. And then the mother comes along and the mother puts a blanket on the baby. Now, or maybe the mother turns on the heater. Now the baby doesn't understand at a conscious level, oh, this is my mother, she's put a blanket over me. But she feels comfort. So that comfort indicates at the subconscious level, yes, there is this, there's my mother and she loves me and her love is manifested through this cool, this comforting, protective blanket that has been put around me. So when the baby is asleep, she cannot see or perceive the mother. Similarly, we as souls are spiritually asleep. And at our current level of consciousness, we can't perceive Krishna. But when we experience solace, strength, security, shelter in the remembrance of Krishna, now, we can understand that to be a representation at our level of Krishna's love for us. So just as for the mother, the blanket and the warmth of the blanket represents the, for the baby, the blanket and its warmth represent the mother's love. Similarly, at our level of awareness, the security, the satisfaction, the shelter that we experience in remembrance of Krishna, that is a evidence, a preliminary evidence, no doubt, but still it's evidence of the love of Krishna which is manifested thus to us. So Krishna is the supremely satisfying object of thought. And the Bhagavad Gita, while later on describing the qualities of a devotee in the 12th chapter, uses a beautiful antithesis. Aniketaha sthiramatir. This is, antithesis is the placing together of two opposite ideas. So, aniketaha means one who has no home. Niketan is home. Aniketa is one who has no home. And sthiramatir. Sthiramatir is the consciousness is fixed. So, Krishna is saying over here, for my devotee, my devotee may not have no home externally for the body. But my devotee has a home for his heart, for her heart. And that home is... My lotus feet. Aniketaha sthiramatir. So we practice bhakti if we understand, if we associate with devotees and understand the purpose of practicing bhakti, then that is primarily because we want Krishna to become the default object of our thought. Sometimes devotees ask, you know, how can I think of Krishna always? It's not practical. Yes, initially it's not practical. But 
We have to begin somewhere. Just like when we have a home, now it's not that we are always going to be in the home. But no matter wherever we are, we know I can always come back home and I can experience shelter. So like that, devotees, there is, there is some time, like when we are chanting, when we are hearing, when we are uh, uh, worshipping the deity, at that time, we fix our consciousness on Krishna. And other times, our consciousness goes to various places. Uh, we have a job, we have family, we have various concerns. So it consciousness goes there. But just as, as soon as our work is there, we come back, work is done, we come back home. So like that, we bring our consciousness back to Krishna. So when I said we make Krishna the home for our heart, what does that mean? The heart is itself not gross. And making a home for the heart doesn't literally mean constructing anything physically. Rather, it means deconstructing our preconceptions of what is our greatest object of love. Object of love. Now, home for the heart means essentially the object of love. Whatever we love the most, that is what we by default think about. Just a few months ago, the Cricket World Cup was going on. I believe the World Cup finals was here in Australia itself. So in India, when we go for programs, you know, there are young people, they're walking on the street and they're imagining I'm the next Sachin Tendulkar. <laughs> you know, moving the bat around and swinging. So what is happening? Physically, they may be on a footpath in, in India, but mentally they are in some cricket stadium on the pitch hitting a batch winning sixer. So whatever we are attached to, whatever is our object of love, that becomes our default object of thought. So essentially making Krishna the home of our heart means that we make Krishna the object of our love, the foremost object of our love. And when that happens, then naturally we may think about other things, but our thoughts will come back to Krishna. So when will this happen? When, it is said over here, we invest our consciousness in Krishna. How do we invest our consciousness? Through our mind, through our intelligence and through our faith. 